How do you say shut up in Turkish? Oh, bloody hell. I'm just going <laughs> to... Oi, shut up! Um, we're talking about human evolution. Uh, we're specifically interested in humans, obviously, because most people in this room are humans. I'm looking around. Most people. Now, here's a cheetah. Humans are fantastic species. Cheetah can run at 60 miles an hour. Watch this. It's chasing a uh, gazelle. Look at that. 60 miles an hour. 100 kilometers an hour almost. And look at that. As I say, humans are an extraordinary species, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> and just in case you're wondering, that's not true, okay? <laughs> um, so, this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about the timeline from ape to human. We're going to talk about what specifically was invented during the human lineage. So the common ancestor between humans and uh, chimpanzees, our closest relative, existed about 7 million years ago. What has happened in that 7 million years since the common ancestor? What innovations have arisen? The big one, for me at least, I don't know about you guys, the big one is the brain. We are, we are extraordinary. We have a fantastic, this organ, even for... Even for you, <laughs> is an amazing learning machine, okay? Um, and it allows us to do something that other species really cannot, which is evolve culturally. So we are subject to two forces, both biological evolution and cultural evolution. And cultural evolution, as I'll tell you, is super fast. What you're looking around today at is really the, pro well, obviously biological evolution, but all the subtle differences, all the changes, the things that have changed technologically in your lifetime, the different clothes you wear from last year, oh, I wouldn't wear those. Um, that's cultural evolution. Um, and so what we are, to a large extent, is a marriage where biology, biological evolution meets culture, cultural evolution. But first of all, I just want to, so look, you might say, look, we're coming to the end of the evolution section of this uh, uh, section of NS102. Maybe we're talking about humans now because we've talked about population genetics, we've talked about speciation, we've talked about phylogenetics, we've talked about the fossil record, we've talked about innovation and genetic mechanisms of uh, developmental change. Maybe now we understand all that, we can get to the climax the culmination, the end goal of evolution. And evolution started small, of an RNA molecule getting slightly bigger, microbe, microbe, microbe. You carry it, you carry it, you carry it. Cambrian explosion, slightly more interesting. Some fish, 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 amphibians. Oh, yes, reptiles. Oh, hoo, hoo. mammals. Us. Hoo, 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 hoo. Is it like that? It's sort of a, a climb from nothing to the top of Mount Everest where we find Andrew Berry, obviously. Um, <laughs> The pinnacle of evolution. Uh, no, folks. We are not the pinnacle of evolution. Absolutely we are not. Now, our brain is better than anyone else's brain. Even his. Okay. Sorry, you don't mind my... He's a genius, actually. I take it back. Um, we have amazing brains. But now, and, and so we can sit around and say, well, evolution is all about creating amazing brains. And we have the best brain. So evolution was all about approaching us. Okay? No. Uh, it did create an amazing brain. But let's pretend you're all elephants. Okay? This is elephant NS102. And we're having a lecture now on elephant evolution. Okay? Now, what, the, what are they going to talk about as the climax of evolution? They're going to look around at other species and they're going to say it's pathetic. They don't have trunks. Think of humans. Funny little pink things. Call that a trunk? 
And the trunk is a fa- and they say, look, a trunk is a fantastic thing. And it is a fantastic thing. Look, I can pick up very small things. I can, oof. I can use it to give myself a shower. Right? I can use it as a snorkel as I'm walking through water. It's, I mean, it's a brilliant invention. And elephants are right. They're brilliant things. Right? So we think we're the best because we have the best brains. Elephants think they're the best because they have the best trunks. Now, what about these guys? Those are bacteria. Now, there are a lot of bacteria in this room. Many of them on you, actually. Um, and they are, they're also, now they're in uh, MS, Microbial Sciences 102, uh, and they are also having their final lecture on the evolution of microbes. And they're feeling pretty pleased with themselves. Okay? They look around and they say, they've read The Origin of Species, and they're talking to each other. They say, well, we know, because they speak kind of loud, like that, uh, we know that uh, Darwin says we should reproduce and have as many children as we can. Okay, which is true, right? That's what natural selection and sexual selection is about. It's about, ultimately, reproduction. And one bacterium will nudge the other bacterium and say, do you know about people? And the other one will say, no, I don't know about people, but I'm living on one. Okay? They take 15 years, 16 years, before they can reproduce. <laughs> That's pathetic. Okay? How long does it take you to reproduce? Oh, 20 minutes. <laughs> right? No. Bacteria are amazing. I mean, they're, they're not very smart. They don't have trunks. But they do one thing fantastically well, which is reproduce super fast. Uh, and as, 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 as our little bacterial friends have pointed out, arguably that's the most important thing in evolution. Okay? So for, the bacteria feel they're massively superior to us and to elephants for exactly those reasons. So all I'm saying is we ain't no pinnacle because every species is a pinnacle. Every species does something super well. Ah, you say, well, why can't we have a few species which do lots of things super well? Okay, why can't we have a species which has a big brain like ours and reproduces every 20 minutes? Blimey. Um, I'll tell you why. Because you, there are inherent constraints in biological processes. If you're going to have a big brain like ours and be super smart, and there are many advantages to that, it takes a long time to build that brain up. Okay? I mean, just think how dumb your kid sister is. Right? Three-year-old sister sort of walking to the top of the stairs and... <laughs> drop. Oh, come on! Right? That's because it's this, the early childhood is this lengthy learning process. The brain, if you like, is being programmed. It takes a lot of time. So it is formally impossible to develop a brain and have very rapid reproduction as per microbes. So different species specialize on different things and it's impossible to specialize on everything because of this idea of trade-off. That if you specialize on one thing, then you're not going to be good at something else. Okay? So, that's an important point to start with. This lecture is not about the pinnacle of evolution. It's about us. We're really interesting. And of course we're interested in us. Because we're humans. And, as you know, we're closely related to great apes. I just want to remind you that if you're a creationist and you have problems with that, just appreciate how stunningly similar. This is an orang, it's not even our closest relative, but it's a close relative. How incredibly, for want of a better word, human these animals are. See the baby?
You might think that this iron woodpan is washing socks as some kind of service trick for which we being especially trained. But not so. She is doing this entirely on her own initiative. She's seen others doing it and she's copying. And that ability to imitate as well as to use tools is something which started among his, but has been brought to a much greater level among the apes. And those two talents were ultimately the lead to the transformation of the world. Um, so, as I said, uh, this is what we're doing. We're going to start with the timeline. So, this is the phylogeny of us and our closest relatives. I always have this problem. Um, who I put as the representative human being. Votes. Who do you think should be the representative for our species here? <laughs> that was a good answer. I like that. Top of the class, you didn't hear it up there. Somebody suggested me. I like that. I'm not sure it's a good idea, though. Any other suggestions? But Lucy's not a member of our species. Okay, Lucy is back here, about three. But I like, the, I like your thinking. Um, but we need a modern human. Somebody, I mean, somebody we all admire or we all despise. David Beckham? <laughs> I know he quit football, but that doesn't make him inferior as a human being. <laughs> um, so I've taken the future queen of England, the, and also because she's now pregnant, so she's emblematic of the great process, evolutionary process of reproduction. Um, so here it is. This is the family tree. Our closest relatives are the chimpanzees. And I say chimpanzees, plural, because there are two species of chimpanzee, uh, very closely related to each other. One is the, so what you might call the normal chimpanzee. The other is the bonobo or pygmy chimpanzee. They split off about seven million years ago. So here's this lineage going to us and the other lineage going here. Uh, this happened in Africa. Um, our next closest relative is another African great ape species, which is the gorilla. And then outside that is a orang, which of course is limited in its distribution to uh, Southeast Asia. So what we're interested in is what happened along here. This ancestor was probably not too different from a, chimpan a modern chimpanzee. Obviously, there's been a lot of evolution along here as well from the ancestor to the modern chimpanzee, but it would have had many chimpanzee-like characteristics. Okay? So what happened along those seven million years? Well, the first place to go is to the fossil record. This is a, a, about probably the first specimen of an uh, individual, a species, that was on our lineage. So in other words, this Sahel Anthropus is about here. It's, it's, once, it's the first specimen we have after the split. Thank you, Ms. Middleton. Now, what, and this is important. This is not a linear track through those seven million years where you've got one species which is changing and evolving and so on and so forth. What it is is a complex bush. Many species are being produced. Okay? This is from the fossil record. Here's the one we just saw, Sahelanthropus, seven million years ago. This is today. Okay? And these are the names of different species which have been described from the fossil record. This is our genus Homo in here's our species, of course. Okay? What I want, don't, the names are completely unimportant. In fact, the ch names change all the time because somebody says, no, this shouldn't be called Australopithecus anamensis, it should be called Australopithecus andrewberriensis or whatever. Okay? Um, all I want you to get from this is we do have a surprisingly rich fossil record. We have a lot of fossil specimens. They hate fossils. Oh, come on, guys. It's only fossils. They're not going to hurt you. Um, um, this is Lucy, famous Australopithecus specimen from about 3.3, 3.2 million years ago. Okay. Um, 
what I want you to appreciate is there are multiple species. This is complex evolution. It's not just a line, it's a bush. Okay? Even though we only have one species with us today. Um, and here's Lucy. Lucy's important. Why? Because we have really a lot of material. So we, there are two things we can say for certain about Lucy. One is uh, she was truly bipedal. She was as bipedal as you are. Okay. Two, I'm killing you with my laser. <laughs> um, uh, two, we have uh, cranial material, skull material, which means we can figure out the size of her brain. So Lucy was bipedal like you or me, but her brain was the size of a chimpanzee's brain. Okay? So she's actually a rather neat intermediate in terms of the evolution of the traits, and almost exactly halfway down that seven million year journey. Um, and again, the names are unimportant, just to sh and these reconstructions are kind of problematic anyway, but still, just to give you a sense of, um, you've got multiple species in multiple environments. Homo erectus was the first species that moved out of Africa. Everything has happened in Africa until about two million years ago when these guys uh, move out of Africa. And then in Europe, you have two species. This is us, modern humans, okay? These are specimens from about um, 30 million years ago in France. And these are Neanderthals. Neanderthals famously, right? Um, but in fact, their brain was a, a, maybe a little bit bigger than ours. Uh, Neanderthals, they tended to, their heads went back that way as opposed to up that way. Uh, but they were large brained creatures. And here they are having a nice barbecue. Um, and these are modern humans, sophisticated tool use. And I mean, this is us, basically. So, where we've had this complex branching process over the past seven million years, and one twig has come out at the end, that's us. How did it happen? Well, there were two basic ideas. Um, one is the so-called multi-regional hypothesis. So, as I said, this is Homo erectus going out of Africa. They've given the figure 1.8 million years. I gave you figure 2 million uh, around then. And it goes out, and it doesn't make it, it goes through into Asia and Europe, it's still in Africa, okay? And one idea is essentially those populations more or less independently evolved modern human characteristics. The alternative is this idea where you had Homo erectus going out, but then you had a new species arising in Africa moving out of, so this is a second out of Africa event and replacing the old Homo erectus populations in Asia and Europe, okay? So how can we distinguish between these two ideas? Actually, very simple with DNA. So uh, what we're gonna do is create a family tree for all humans, okay? So I'm gonna go to New Guinea and get some DNA from people in New Guinea. I'm gonna go to Japan, and get DNA from people in Japan. I'm gonna go to Turkey and ask this young lady to give me some DNA. I'm gonna go to England and get some DNA from me and so on and so forth. And then I'm simply going to sequence the DNA and do the kind of phylogenetic reconstruction that we talked about last time. Okay? And what do I, well, and I'm making a prediction. If this is true, the common ancestor of all modern humans probably existed about 1.8 or 2 million years ago. If this is true, the common ancestor of all modern humans existed much more recently maybe on the order of 200,000 years or something, okay? So that's the distinction that we're looking for, the depth of the family tree. There it is, folks. Oh, no! Look at that. Isn't that a lovely graph? No, don't worry. You don't have to. It's not on the final. You don't have to learn this or anything. This is just the data. Oh, I, I should say, sorry. What was used was mitochondrial DNA, so, as you, you all know what mitochondria are, they're uh, in every cell, many of them in every cell, um, and they have their own DNA, um, and it turns out for various technical reasons it's easy to study. So, 
this is the region of DNA that was used. And by the way, mitochondrial DNA is maternally transmitted. Okay? Think back to the egg swimming up to the sperm. The sp sorry, the sperm swimming up to the egg. The sperm is only contributing chromosomes, nothing else. So my mitochondria, my mitochondria, and therefore my mitochondrial DNA comes from my mother. So those are in the egg that the sperm, uh, sperm uh, fertilized. Now, so that's the complex story. The simple story is this, okay? Two really remarkable things about the simplified version here. Um, one is uh, that everything is happening in Africa. Okay, the com this is the common ancestor of all modern humans is in an African branch of the tree. And therefore, non-Africans, everyone in this room by looks of things, is the product of a group of Africans that moved out of Africa. Okay? Right here. So Africa is where it happened. And two, the depth of this tree is very shallow. Okay? This is on the order of 200,000 years. So that alternative idea, the multi-regional hypothesis, is out the window. Because that predicted about that this would be about 2 million years, not 200,000 years. Okay? Now, that's just mitochondrial DNA. Let's check this data with another source of data. Let's actually use male DNA. And so you can use the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is only in males, right? If I were to inject Supan with a Y chromosome, she'd turn into a guy. Like a lot of Y chromosomes, I hasten to say. And it's not a very realistic experiment. Don't try it, please. Um, no. Only a Y chromosome is what makes you male, right? So by studying the pattern of variation in different populations on the Y chromosome, we're studying now the evolution of males. What do we see? Again, the details are unimportant. You see the same thing. Origin in Africa on the order of, you know, 150, 200,000 years ago, and then one population moving out of Africa and colonizing the rest of the planet. So, here's the scenario, and these figures are, you know, take with a pinch of salt, but humans evolved very recently in Africa, and even more recently, non-Africans moved out of Africa and spread out through the rest of the planet. And the story of spreading out, as you probably know, is now beautifully docu documented. Here's humans coming out of Africa, and because mutations arise and they get shared in different populations, by se sequencing DNA, especially Y chromosome DNA and mitochondrial DNA, we can reconstruct the colonization history of the planet. We can figure out where the Turks came from. The great mystery. Okay? Um, and some of these results are really crazy. So I'd say all of... Uh, this evolution has been occurring here in Africa. What about Madagascar? People didn't get to Madagascar until 2,000 years ago, very recently. And where do they come from? Well, they came from Africa, surely. It's just next door. No. They came from Southeast Asia. Again, the genetics of the uh, people of Madagascar it corresponds to the genetics of people from Southeast Asia, from Indonesia. And so, to linguistically, they speak uh, versions of uh, Southeast Asian languages. Okay, so this is our scenario. Um, about two million years ago, you have Homo erectus heading out and from Africa and inhabiting both Europe and Asia. You get um, uh, Neanderthals arising in Europe. And then in Africa, very late, you get the origin of our species, and that spreads out, obviously, from Africa across the planet. Well, what happened to the Neanderthals? Okay? Remember, they were in Europe at about the same time as the first modern human Europeans arrived. So here they are. They disappeared about 30,000 years ago. Now, really cool. We could get 
mitochondrial DNA from ancient bone specimens, 30,000-year-old Neanderthal bone specimens. Now we can add mitochondrial DNA from Neanderthals to the family tree I just showed you. What's the story? Very simple, actually. Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA is quite different from modern human DNA. It's over here by itself on the family tree. We've got multiple Neanderthal DNAs, all of which are quite similar. So, what does that tell you? That tells you that modern humans and Neanderthals, even though they would have met probably in Europe, did not interbreed. So what does that mean? What happened to the Neanderthals? Well, if we didn't have sex with them, what did we do to them? We killed them. That's the alternative. Either you sleep with someone or you kill them, right? Um, <laughs> don't write that down. <laughs> um, no, what that implies, if there's no interbreeding, then we must have displaced them, whether we directly had a fight, <laughs> or whether we just, we were better at hunting, let's say. So we ate all the deer, and there was nothing for the Neanderthals. I don't know. But this suggests that we competitively displaced them in some way. Now, if I was teaching this class three years ago, that would be the end of it. That would be the story. We did not have sex with Neanderthals. Okay? Now I'm going to change that story. Very recent study. Really amazing. Now we can study not just mitochondrial DNA, but the entire genome of Neanderthals. Okay? Again, this is technologically amazing using this 30,000 year old material. What do we find? We find a complete contradiction to the previous result. We find that Neanderthals and modern humans had sex. Well, you've just told us they didn't. Be consistent, Dr. Barry. What's critical here is everyone in this room, unless you're African, we, no, we don't have any Africans here, right? Everyone in this room, including me, is between 1 and 4% Neanderthal. Some of you, I'm looking around, are maybe up at the 5% level. Um, so, what happened, and this is really cool, because we, we can reconstruct this now with all this genomic data, is modern humans came out of Africa into the Middle East, not far from here, where uh, Neanderthal populations were already established. Okay? And that was when the interbreeding took place, because then Europe, modern Europeans have Neanderthal DNA. So do modern Chinese. They have Neanderthal DNA. So do modern Melanesians in New Guinea. They have Neanderthal DNA. Okay? So that's what happened. But how can you account for the fact, you, you said, we just saw a plot that showed that mitochondrial DNA said no interbreeding, and now you're telling us there's interbreeding. Well, remember the key thing. Neanderthal DNA is female inherited. So what that is suggesting, that there is no Neanderthal female input into the modern population. That doesn't mean to say there can't be male input. Okay? And think about it. If you are a pretty young... Well, we're a couple. We're just come out of Africa. We're attractive young couple of... Uh, of modern humans, we're in the Middle East, and a beautiful Neanderthal female comes up to me. Hi. <laughs> I said, no, uh, 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 uh. Now, my girlfriend, who's just behind me, is jumped by a bunch of guys, Neanderthal guys. They probably don't ask her, right? Uh, I mean, look, this is, I'm, I'm making this up, but you, you understand, if the Neanderthal DNA came from males only, and you know that's a plausible scenario. Then you would get this exact pattern that we see. Mitochondrial DNA shows no interbreeding with Neanderthals, whereas the genomic DNA does. So, what do we invent? Well, there's a list of them. Bipedalism is a big. Why is bipedalism such a big idea? I'll tell you. It involved a huge amount of anatomical changing. But think about this. Okay, 
I'm a chimpanzee. How do I get around on the ground? I knuckle walk. Okay? What does that mean? That means I'm using these things for locomotion as feet. Okay? What does that mean? Well, it means that they have to be pretty tough because they're bearing my weight. Okay? Now I stand up. And there are all sorts of reasons I might want to stand up. Maybe there's lots of water. Maybe I'm in long grass. I want to get a view. I don't know why I stood up. But now I'm not using these hands as feet. What does that mean? It means that we're free to become much more dexterous, much more versatile. So our thumb is very superior in terms of its dexterity relative to chimpanzee. Okay? Now, okay, good. I've got dexterous hands and I'm on two feet, like Lucy. What does that mean? Well, think of it before... I'm a chimpanzee. I want to eat something. What do I do? <laughs> okay. Oh, wow, wow, woo. It's all in the mouth. I have to process everything. I have to catch my food with my mouth. All right? Now I'm a human. Oops. So what, no. Okay, so in other words, the mouth is no longer required to be the main prey capture apparatus. Okay? Which means I don't have to have huge muscles and great teeth and very strong jaw. I can have a much more refined, a much more subtle, uh, 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 more delicate musculature. What does that mean? I can use my mouth for other things as well as eating, like speaking. Okay, so much finer motor control is required for human speech. That's why bipedalism is important. It started a chain of many outcomes. Why do we become hairless? Interesting question. Well, and this is one theory that we evolved. We evolved. Uh, to hunt in the plains of Africa uh, by persistence hunting or endurance hunting. Basically, we would hunt by running down our prey. Now, bipedalism is more efficient than running on two forelegs. It's generally slower, so you just keep going. Okay? The critical thing, and an antelope can run away fast, but then it overheats. And has to wait. And it can run away fast again. I just keep... Okay? And this is, this is a group in uh, Kalahari that still hunts this way. And the claim, therefore... So losing body hair is all about being able to lose heat. It's about cooling. It's about sweat. Right? Uh, uh, it's just one idea. Um, this is a big one, though. We have super brains. This is chimpanzee brain. This is our brain. Uh, and look, I don't have to convince you that our brain is large, but obviously brains get bigger with body, size, body weight. This is, this is a log-log scale. This is the, the expectation, if you like, the mean. Um, we are way, way off our expected uh, size for brain. Ostrich and goldfish have rather small brains, I'm afraid. Um, and we can look at the fossil record. Here's Lucy. So Lucy has about the same size of brain as a chimpanzee. So these, the dots are different individuals. This is brain size, and this is our species. Okay. So, again, there are 100 million possible reasons why brains became bigger. But the way I want you to think about it is that we don't, and I can't, you know, maybe it was to facilitate communication. Maybe it was to facilitate individual recognition in small social groups. I don't know. And we'll probably never know. One thing is clear, though, is natural selection drove an increase in brain size. 
until it reached a threshold. And at that threshold, it was this extraordinary learning organ that allowed it to do lots of other things. Let's, th let's think through analogy. Think of a pocket calculator. In the 70s, it was super simple. All it could do was add and subtract and multiply. Okay? But then you've got selection for ever greater complexity. Okay? It's always to do maths, okay? but it's getting more complicated until you have one of those super nerdy calculators with graphing functions and everything else. Right? Keep going along that trajectory, and you have a mini computer. right? And in fact, that's what ultimately the calculator became. It became a computer. So well, there's one trajectory of selection in favor of doing maths, but suddenly now you've got a processor of so much power, you can play games with it. You can Facebook with it. You can, it's a computer. Okay? Once you've crossed that threshold of sophistication, of complexity, you've got something which is very generally purposeful. So... That's the point. Brain function. Um, can, uh, there we go. Yes. Um, brain function uh, expanded slowly, but then you hit this threshold and bang! Alleluia. And, and, so, and this is important. Most of what we do is simply a byproduct of that process. Okay? In the same way as a computer that was developed originally as a mathematical machine, which you're now using as a general communication device, that's just a byproduct of its functionality. Now, the key thing about this brain is it allows us to learn and acquire information, which means that most evolution is cultural in our species. So look, let's take a change in fashion. All right? Skinny jeans. Now imagine that this was biological evolution. Okay? There's a mutation, the first new mutation from flared to skinny. Okay? This individual will leave a few more offspring in the next generation. And the next generation, those will leave a few more offspring. So in other words, the spread of skinny genes through the human population would take maybe 100,000 years. You know, obviously, that it's instantaneous because we emulate because we are cultural animals. So that's the key thing, that cultural evolution is horizontal. It's transferred from individual to individual, not vertical. Vertical transmission is me to my children. Uh, and it's effectively instantaneous. So a lot of what we see in our species is an interaction between biological evolution and... Um, cultural evolution. I'll give you a nice example. Let's do a thought experiment. How fast do males and females spread in the history of our species? Okay. Now we can actually, so this is going to be the thought experiment we're going to do. We have a novel mitochondrial DNA, remember that's a maternal mutation in pink because I'm sexist, and blue for a Y chromosome. So, so how quick, they're both happening, they both occur in Cape Town in Africa. How quickly are they going to spread? Well, look, you know what's going to happen. I don't have to tell you. Um, females are boring. Uh, I'll just stay at home. I'm going to knit. Uh, uh, I'm boring. I'm female. You know what female, guys. <laughs> and what about guys? <laughs> what we do, what we do, is we go off on conquests. We get on horses. And we shoot off to other places and we spray sperm around, which is what guys like to do. Um, um, so look, it's a no-brainer, right? Men are the movers. The women are boring, stay at home, nobodies. I mean, think of the men. I mean, look, Colin Farrell with blonde highlights. Um, I think actually Alexander the Great was gay, so maybe he didn't do a lot of spreading his Y chromosome around. But anyway, um, so is this true? No, I'm completely wrong. It's actually really interesting. Now, it's a slightly complicated graph, but let me explain it to you. This is a measure of how different two 
populations are at a genetic level. Okay? And each point is two populations. And this is the distance in kilometers between the populations. Okay? Now, let's look at the circles. The circles are mitochondrial DNA. So here's a population which is, what, 350 kilometers apart, and two populations which are 350 kilometers apart, and they have a very low level of genetic difference. Now, what prevents genetic difference? Gene flow, right? Migration from population to population. If we have a lot of isolation, then mutations that rise in this population don't appear in this population. If we have a lot of gene flow between the two populations, then all the population, all the mutations are shared. Okay? So this low value says lots of gene flow. And by the way, when we go out to a thousand kilometers for mitochondrial DNA, there's still lots of gene flow. What does gene flow mean? It means lots of migration. Females are migrating lots. Males they have a lot of genetic difference between distant populations, are not migrating very much. That's crazy. So, even though, yes, males do go off on conquests and so on, sometimes, most of the time they don't. Okay? And it's this system called patrilocality which drives uh, this imbalance in terms of male-female migration. The system is this. I live in village A. I have a son and a daughter. My daughter marries a man from village B and travels to village B. My son marries a woman from village C. She travels to my village. The males don't actually move. It's the females that do the moving. And they're just small village to village movements, but over the broad span of uh, human evolution, that's what you see. The females are, I got it completely wrong, the movers and shakers. Well done, females. Now, another thing which is absolutely critical here is because we were in Africa until very recently, there's been very little time for different populations, different races, to evolve different characteristics. Okay? So it turns out that only of all the total amount of genetic variation in the human population, 85% is in a single population. So let's say the world was about the end. I had one space rocket that could take us to Mars. Who would I put with 20 places? Who would I put in there? Well, I'd go to Australia and get an Aboriginal. Go to Japan to get Japanese. I'd take a Turk. This gentleman. Um, <laughs> mistake. Um, I'd go to England and get me, right? I mean, obviously, um, I would try to select as big a diversity as possible. But if I didn't have time, and I just took Turks, just, in fact, just these guys, okay? Even that single population, there's still 85% of the total amount of human genetic variation is present in this small population. Now, certain things are missing. There's no black-skinned person in this population, right? That's missing. There's no person with um, very tight black curly hair, that, that gene's missing. That's part of the 15% that isn't present in that population, but most of it is present. Um, so, let's say race is a weird idea. A black guy looks very different from me, but in fact, in genetic terms, he's stunningly similar. Um, so how can we account for the differences we see? Here's David Beckham, here's Drogba, a good Turkish footballer. Um, um, two obvious things. Natural selection, partly responsible. So having dark skin in Africa is important to prevent damage by the sun. In northern areas, you need white skin in order to get enough sun to generate critical vitamins, vitamin D synthesis. Okay? That's presumably natural selection. Uh, also, the body size. If you're tall and thin in a very hot place, that's good for losing uh, dissipating heat. Whereas if you're in a cold place like the Eskimos, uh, you want to be short and squat. But that's, natural selection is only going to explain a certain amount of the differences we see between people. Uh, this is my final serious slide. Um, 
So here's our 85% variation within races, so here's our 15%. My guess is there is a non-random distribution of traits that affect appearance in this distribution. Okay? So trait loci that affect appearance are overrepresented in the between race category. Now what does that mean? Well, sort of it's telling you something that's already obvious. Different racial groups look very different. Okay? And yeah, I've just told you, genetically they're extremely similar. So this sort of reconciles that. We can say the few differences they are tend to be things that you can see. Now, how would that happen in evolution? Sexual selection. Remember, sexual selection is a powerful source of genetic change. Let's do a thought experiment. Here's an important queen early in human prehistory. And there are five guys in front of her. There's a black guy with dark curly hair. There's an Asian guy with uh, almond-shaped eyes. There's a white guy. There's an Irish guy with ginger hair. You know, whatever. And she says, I like the Asian guy. The guy with black straight hair, almond-shaped eyes, olive skin. Okay? Fine. But what has happened? This is human. This is the interaction with culture. Every other female in that population says, oh, wow. The big queen to the Asian guy, Asian guys are hot. Right? So what does that mean? Suddenly, in one generation, that population, all the other guys, the white guy, the black guy, the, the Irish guy, whatever, they all got thrown away. Right? One generation from cultural evolution, which is the preference the queen expressed and everyone copying it, has affected the genetic composition of the next generation and causing particularly for traits that you can see. So Darwin was the one who originally suggested that the differences we see between uh, human groups today are attributable to natural selection, and I think he's right. Okay? So, final thing I want to say is we're not the only species with culture. Other species, including this guy, this is a chimpanzee, different populations of chimpanzees use different tools to get ants out of an ant colony. They want to eat ants. How are you going to get them out? You use sticks. But if you're in population one, you use this kind of stick. If you're in population two, you use a different kind of stick. And that's because individuals in population two have learned this from other individuals in population two, and individuals in population one have learned their trick from... That's culture, folks. So we're not the only ones with culture. But don't get me wrong. Our culture is a triumph. And it's one of the reasons I love coming to your country, Turks, is much of humanity's greatest cultural achievements are right here in Istanbul. I will see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. for my lecture on Alfred Russell Wallace, which I'm sure you're excited to hear. And then at 9 a.m. on Wednesday for the final two lectures of my session. Igor Nacht.